dear friends welcome to the introduction with sri suresh mula ji the founder of quinto solutions mumbai welcome sir thank you thank you mr shakti sir uh, we are all quality enthusiasts so i i would like to know how you got into the field of quality purely by accident <laughs> I was a student in Detroit in the 60s. I landed late for my registration and the only subjects available to me were reliability engineering and a few very advanced subjects. I got into it and uh, we had excellent faculty from General Motors. Um uh, that got me hooked. I was doing reliability engineering before learning quality. So that's how I got involved and uh, learned more about Dr. Jiran, the handbook, etc. and just got too fascinated by the subject. Although I never practiced it in America. Uh, my jobs took me into economics and I was with Dr. James Cross the authority on economics all I did was programming and uh, using industrial engineering methods of queuing and uh, queuing to f- locate gas stations at for Sun Oil company that was my stint with Sun Oil Company then i moved to schmidt's brewery where i continued as an economist came back to india and after a major went into tata economic consulting where again i was an economist i don't know what i was doing as an economist or a pure engineer moved down to a Ferguson and Company where by some providence I got an assignment with Cummins. At Cummins, uh, the nature of the assignment was one of field failures of diesel engines. Field failures meant having after sale service, response time mean time to repair mean time between failures that expanded uh, the chief executive officer then Mr. R.V. Ranchanan was also a quality enthusiast and so between the two of us we did pretty much of a good job I would say for seven years with companies it finally came to what was i doing in ferguson's and mr ramshan then took the initiative of getting me an assignment not an assignment a contract with the juran institute and um, that's how i landed up in quality so oh, once your assignment in us got over and when you came back to india how was the situation in india might be the uh, people here knew a bit of quality may not be the uh, relevance of quality or at least the quality studies and department and so on how was it here oh, when i came back was a very difficult time uh, that was the time we had the emergency in the country so the question of survival and things like that were a priority i had two children and I was getting very confused with a green card in hand what am i doing in this part of the world then there was the opec crisis which added to the cost push to everything it was chaotic 
but uh, somehow I muddled my way through and uh, it was the likes of Sri Ramakrishna Bajaj who was one of my clients who almost counseled me into reconsidering my decision to go back. I stayed on and quality was not on the agenda for me when I came. It was only after I left Ferguson's that it became a focused area. That was thanks to the chairman of Commons, Ram Chandra. Sir, how was your uh, stint with the Tatas? What I understand uh, from our earlier conversation is that you are very close to uh, Rusi Modiji and how was your interaction with him? Again, that was an accident. <laughs> Two years of representing Dr. Jiran and not getting a client and then landing up at a chairman of Tata Steel. Not quite sure what's going to come out of that. But he had the um, foresight to be, <clears throat> to be able to see the financial benefit of good quality. Tata Steel in that, at that time was the darling of the share market. And in our conversation where I asked him, what's your rejection rate? He said 3%. I was aghast. But he wasn't. According to him, uh, even the 3% rejects had a market. So there's no problem with Tata Steel at that point, he, according to him. When he realized that the cost of poor quality for Tata Steel is at least 10% of total cost, that's when he got his leadership team embrace quality and when they embrace quality they discovered it's 35 percent of total sales. That set the vision for Dr. J.J. Rani. If this is the case then we need to be the lowest cost steel producer in the world in the next 10 years. And Dr. J.J. Rani led from the front. In 10 years that's 1999 to be precise. In two product lines, they had already become the leaders in the world. Two years later, 2001, in most products. In 2008, they became so confident of their ability, they even bid for a sick unit in the UK, Chorus and turned it around into a successful organization. So you have very strong believers in Tata Steel and all stems from Mr. Rusi Modi actually seeing the power of quality. So now you being in the field of quality, how do you sell the idea of quality? Like what is the, when you reach, go to your clients, I know uh, clients come to you, but if a new beginner uh, is a person who is just starting a future, uh, his career in quality and how, how is quality sold? Suppose I am a new consultant, I am planning to start a new venture. H how will the client uh, take me? Well, you have got to speak their language because our approach is quality is a top-down subject. Unless the leader has a customer focus, and can incorporate quality in the strategic plan, which means translate the quality opportunity into money. It doesn't work otherwise. So we speak that language and say, how would you like to double your profit without any capital investment in the next two years? They can't believe this. What option did they have otherwise? And <clears throat> they could double their plant, double their investment, maybe take five years and pray to God they have that many customers. So 
it is very appealing to top management to know that I can improve their bottom line. And for the record, cumulatively over the years, we have saved our clients over two billion dollars for a small size consulting firm that is only facilitating change. That's a pretty dramatic figure. So uh, when you talk of top down, I once again come back to Dr. Juran. So like Jesus Christ had his trial apostles or direct students, <laughs> I understand you are also a direct student of Dr. Juran. How was your experience with him as a human being and so on? Dr. Juran taught me how to treat people with dignity. Let me explain it with an episode. My first training program that I attended in London, that was, we were like 100 people in the auditorium and someone in row, sorry, he asked me to sit in the last row in the worst seat and observe him. How does he conduct training? I didn't know quality as a subject the way he knew, but I had to observe the process of teaching. Let's say the fifth row, some 23rd seat, someone asked him a very fundamental question. Sitting right at the distance, I got the feeling that he was giving 110% attention only to that person in this whole ocean of people. And that's an ability I have never seen with anybody else. And likewise, so at the session he asked me, so what did you learn? I said, I have to ask you a very simple question. The question asked of you was so fundamental, everyone would have known it. And uh, you didn't stop the person, you let the person narrate the whole question. He said, look, that person is my customer and that person is confident or has dared to ask a question in the presence of so many people as fundamental as it is. I have to respect that. Three, the question asked of me uh, I could have interrupted and said, oh, uh, I, kn I know the answer. He said, but the person, I don't know the background of the person. Maybe there was a certain perspective with which the person was asking me a question. So I had to listen. And you listen with your eyes and your ears. So, I realized, you know, the dignity he gave that person and uh, he made sure we learned this <laughs> that technique. So, his humility, he did so much for quality, he did so much for Japan, but he was as humble as you could imagine. His etiquette with everybody was so perfect and it wasn't artificial, it was very natural. So you just had to see him and learn and you ultimately realize that you want quality, be a good human being first and that's what he was. Once again, coming back from Juran, Dr. Juran to Dr. Rusi Modi. He was a more of a people manager and I IR man, what we understand. Any of the incidents you would uh, like to quote, you, your interaction with him, which you want to highlight? Mr. Rusi Modi was probably the most interesting human being I have ever met because he was unpredictable. 
he would always do something out of the box. And uh, Mr. Modi, when we were doing the pilot work at Tata Steel, every head of uh, unit would say, I want the pilot work done, I want the pilot work. We were willing to do five pilot projects. And they were talking a large sums of money that can be saved and the shareholder would benefit and things like that. He stood up and told them, oh, keep quiet. I have 65,000 people at Jamshedpur. I have to build a culture of quality in them. I'm not interested in the shareholder. We are anyway the darling of the share market. I want to do the pilot work where the worker sees the benefit directly, experiences the benefit directly, and volunteers to come forward on the quality journey. So here are all the top people of Tata Steel, and I can tell you the who's who, and the successors and managing directors at that time much younger were all sitting there including the financial wizard Ishad Hussain and the nominations that came up were leaking roofs in the quarters and garbage not collected from the quarters. And these are chronic problems and uh, top management actually got involved in solving these problems and the kind of savings that accrued from garbage not collected because it led to a chain of uh, remedial actions going all the way into making the corrections in the hospital, Tata Hospital. The accrued benefits were of the order of 80 crore per annum in recurring in year one which shocked them, shocked them, you know, at the benefit. It only reinforced Dr. J.J. Rani's drive. We are going to be the lowest cost producer. So coming back to the personal side of Lulaji. So usually, uh, quality people, I feel, are very structured. They want everything in place. Is it that uh, you... Uh, are very structured, you plan everything in detail, do you get disturbed if something goes somewhat not as per your plans? How, we, how, how I want to know the personal side of you. No, I, I think punctuality is important because you're showing respect to the other side. And um, For example, my own staff and all, I make sure that they are available three to five minutes before the time, they're available so that the appointment can happen. I'm also particular with my staff that uh, they dress appropriately when they go to a client. It's a form of respect. Even if the client is a very casual one, you know, casual, uh, casually dress. You go for your first meeting with a certain degree of formality. If after a few meetings, then you want to blend with their, their management, it's okay. Whether I get upset, I would get upset if I am late. But I'm more flexible when somebody else is late. <laughs> That's the reality. I, I, I don't want anyone inconvenience because I came late. And I have a reputation <laughs> where people check their watch when I walk in for a meeting. It's, it's been... Uh, one of the qualities <laughs> that have been built or acquired over the years. How does your day start in the morning and 
how how is your whole day how do you schedule it in the past i would be traveling quite a bit and i was in total denial when my i was accused by my wife that you travel too much and i'd say no i haven't traveled <laughs> i deny it but yes i was traveling like 20 days in a month so there's no real pattern that i can think of at that time but i've slowed down uh in the last 10 years slow down my pace and i do get an opportunity to sit in my balcony overlooking the arabian sea and um i like to have my cup of tea and read newspapers till you know the cows come home <laughs> it's relaxing to me i i can't read the paper without a cup of tea and i can't have my tea without my paper <laughs> and that's how it starts but planning the day a little checklist what has to be accomplished and I try to adhere to that. Uh, when you first meet your client, uh, wh- how do you assess the client? Will he might be my client, or uh, like a first look? How do you assess your client? Will he be able to take my suggestions, or uh, how will our relationship continue? How do you assess it? I don't only meet one on one. the first meeting is usually the top management is sitting and there may be 7 to 12 people sitting i have to get a buy in with them and if i'm not getting a buy in i don't take the assignment but usually you know i am called because they want to give me the assignment and there would be some cases where i have stayed away i also like to be in the company of good companies and uh, so there is a question of values of that company which plays an important part i i don't want to go into an organization that willing to pay me the sky but i don't like their ethics um so my clients are a very rich list and they are all very respectable organizations uh and word spreads around you know in the beginning uh, people try to entice you with all kinds of things once they realize he's not in that game and a lot of this does happen in consulting uh, you have to <laughs> mm. uh, so now I, i want a message from you for students of quality who want to take quality as their profession first of all i think <clears throat> quality is in every job so i don't see it as a specialized one it's an integral part of any 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 job uh, whether you're in uh, manufacturing you're in a support service whether you are in purchasing whether you're an artist also quality has to be there uh you have to see how even a musician practices to be able to get that perfection the commitment Now, that is quality and uh, students have no choice they have to integrate it when i started out quality was a choice today it's not a choice your customers expect quality at any cost and they'll punish you if you don't deliver quality